Right. Welcome to another edition of Caribbean Close Up, a production of Carib Direct. And this week we have with us the talented musician, producer, arranger, Dennis Boville, the creator of Lovers Rock. Welcome, Dennis. Good evening. Tell us about your childhood, Dennis, how it all started. Well, as a young boy, I was um, brought up in a part of Barbados called St. Peter. It's in the north of the island. And um, I lived with my grandparents. Uh, but my parents had already left to um, take residence in London. And, um, you know, we're, they were a Seventh-day Adventist family, which meant um, church on a Saturday. Um, so I didn't have much time to play with other kids in the neighborhood because when they were playing out on a Saturday, I was getting ready to go to church. Mm. Uh, and on a Sunday, when I could play out, they were probably in church. Um, my grandfather was the local Seventh-day Adventist minister. Um, he was a lay preacher, and um, in his job, he was a carpenter. And uh, my grandmother was just, you know, a housewife. And she had nine children. So they had um, five boys that were a quartet. And that quartet was called the Walker Brothers, um, after my grandmother's maiden name. Mm -hmm. Because um, before she had married my grandfather, who was, um, his name was Beresford Headley. Uh, her name was Daphne Walker. And uh, so she became Daphne Headley, and uh, all the children became Headleys. And my my mum was the eldest daughter. And uh, what happened was my father had um, gone to be a student of music from my grandfather, and uh, met my mother. And I was the first production. So um, it it was quite rural. Um, you know, we weren't wealthy, um, but my grandfather made sure that all his children went to university mm. a great sacrifice and um so one of his sons the youngest one in fact my uncle samuel we used to call him uncle sam um he decided that he wasn't really into the religious thing because all the other brothers were this quartet that sang on the radio sang spiritual sang for all religious you know ceremonies and stuff and uh, he wasn't quite into that. He wanted to play Calypso. So he joined a band called Barbara and the Rhythm Airs from Barbados. And uh, this was frowned upon, of course. My grandparents, you know, were um, uh, very respected people in the neighborhood that uh, were devout Christians, you know. Um, and so to have their son up on the bandstand <laughs> playing Calypso was not something to be proud of as far as they were concerned. But um, I admired him. And um, at one point, when I was about 10, I, you know, plucked up the courage to ask him if he would teach me how to play the guitar. Um, he did. But before he did so, he made me sing the open tuning, which is the notes, the sound that the notes make with without any... Um, any fingers touching the fretboard mm -hmm. and um, just the, the, the open tuning, the, the, the sound that each string should make of its own accord, you know, if it was if it was accorded without being pressed. Right. And that tune was, it went like this way. Do, da, 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 da. Right? That's the song it sings. When you hit a guitar like that and all yeah. the notes are in tune. So he taught me to do that. And then when I was able to sing that, you know, at like the drop of a hat, he goes, sing the open tuning. And I sing the open tuning, go, all right, you ready? Then he started to teach me um, how to play the chord of C, the chord of F. You were 10? Yes. It's the incredible. chord of G. And embodied in those three chords were the song, Oh, When the Saints Go Marching In. So I start off in C, Oh, When the Saints mm -hmm. Go Marching In, still on C. Or when the saints go marching in. <laughs> and on your G, you got to go on that in. you got to go on G. Mm. Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number. And numbers on C again. When the saints, F, go marching in. Right? 
and then it would, you know, I'd have to learn how to change from one chord to the other, you know, um, like juggling, mm -hmm. you know, smoothly, <laughs> like learning to drive and changing the gears without crunching them, you know, and uh, that was tremendous um, excitement for me to then show other children that I, you know, learnt that and actually take the guitar in church service and play in front of the whole congregation, you know. Um, but quickly, uh, I, we received a letter from my parents saying my time in Barbados was up and that I was expected to join them in London. To my disappointment, I didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. um, because I thought, well, you know, life is, you know, really nice here. The sun shines every day. We've got these lovely beaches, <laughs> lovely fruit. You know, we lived under a mango tree, as it were. I mean, sometimes I remember um, lying in bed and hearing the mangoes go plop and dropping mm -hmm. on the roof and thinking, right, I get that in the morning before the birds do. <laughs> you know, um, there was, you know, a breadfruit tree in the back garden. There was a tamarind tree next door. There was a cane, of, um, a field of sugar cane behind the house that when it was cut, we could, you know, it was on a hill. We used to we get um, cardboard boxes and make um, sleighs out of them. Mm. So when, when, when the canes were cut and it was just the trash on the floor, it's quite smooth, and, and it, there was a, a bit of a grade, we'd get in the cardboard box and just go down it. Yeah. Like, like if it was, you know, we were going down a slope a slope of snow or something <laughs> right and then walk back up the end and, and that was our kind of you know enjoyment mm. so you had a very musical upbringing absolutely um so you had your foundation in music from your uncle and then you came to the uk now so mm. what age were you introduced to uk life well by the time i arrived in london <clears throat> i was 12 years old and uh getting to know my parents again you know I mean I hadn't seen m my dad since I was five and my mum since I was seven or eight you know and four years for a, a young boy is like in an eternity almost mm -hmm. and so I remember arriving in, in July 1965 here yeah, and um spotting my mum in the crowd waiting for me and walking straight up to her she was like oh. Because by then I had grown and I was um, almost as tall as, if not a little bit taller than my mother, you know. And um, people just couldn't believe that I was her son. She's got oh, a big boy. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I didn't really see myself as that. I just saw, oh, that's my mom, you know. And then uh, when we, I remember when we got um, home, I was hearing for the first time... Um, people of different with different with different accents you know and uh one of them said to me um, which one is your papa and um my dad was sat there and, and my dad's cousin was sat there and uh, a couple of other you know male members of the family were sat there and uh, this person was wondering if i remembered what my dad looked like mm. of course i pointed him out and um then I had to persuade my parents to buy me a guitar. Ah. Because I'd said, you know, I can play the guitar, I need a guitar, buy me a guitar, you know. And my dad was like, no. You know, um, he was like, I'll buy you some textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> Education for you. <laughs> yeah. And anyway, I convinced my mum that I was worthy of having a guitar. And so she went out and got me one. And then I met some boys at school who had a pop band. And they were looking for a guitarist singer to join the band. There was three white kids, um, a guitarist, a bass player, and a drummer. The bass player wasn't um, the best bass player you've ever heard. <laughs> and, and he lived on my street. Mm. So... Um, being a neighbour, I said to him, all right, and his his grandmother bought him uh, a bass guitar for Christmas. So he'd come over to mine, and I'd show him bass lines, you know, simple things like um, the bass line to Green Onions, Booker T and the MGs. Mm. 
and uh, the bass line to My Girl, you know, Otis Redding. Uh, songs like that, relatively easy, and then we'd play along together. And then um, I managed to join the band. They, you know, thought I was the person they were looking for to join the band. And it was a bit of a phenomenon because then I was the only black kid in the band. And um, hanging around with them, I was hanging around mostly with white kids and white mm -hmm. people, in fact. You know, uh, um, a lot of them were amazed that some little black kid who just came from they don't know where, <laughs> right, had the ability to play like Beatles songs mm -hmm. and could play, you know, bits of um, The Who or bits of The Rolling Stones. I remember one time dazzling them because I could play Satisfaction, you know, da, 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 mm -hmm. da, which is relatively easy. But um, they were like, what, you can play that, you know? And and they believed in me in a, in a kind of way and because I studied um, at home because in my room, to keep me indoors, my father had given me um, a radiogram. It's a stereo um, record player uh, with a changer that you could pile all the records on top mm -hmm. and then they would drop down, yeah, you know, one after the other, one after the other <laughs> once they finished playing. And to, to all these other kids, that was like a luxury. It's like, what? You're, you've got one of them in your room. <laughs> and at the back of it, um, it had an input. So I then devised a way so I could have all my friends in, in my bedroom and plug all our guitars into the stereogram mm. and so have an amplifier. <laughs> <laughs> Genius. You know, <laughs> and um, so I, I never really went out and that pleased my dad because that was at a time when... Um, you know, um, the police were, you know, criminalizing young black youth, um, you know, by the second, um, uh, or causing them to be criminalized. And so my father was fearful of me being out on the streets and hanging out with the wrong crowd. So he gave me permission to bring anyone I wanted to, to the house. Okay. As long as they were interested in music and we were doing something, you know, that kept me off the street, he loved that. So, you know, I, I, my house was frequently like the school playground. Yes, Dennis. So so basically you had quite a following in terms of your, your skill to play the guitar. And as you said, it was a good thing for you to do at the time, you know, given the, the circumstances. The climate, yeah. And, and so on. <coughs> yeah. Um, we played for school assemblies, um, friends' birthday parties. In fact, um, when... Well, at the time we were 15, we entered a talent competition in Vox Hall, where we were the youngest group there, and we came third. Mm. And we got a bigger space in the, um, the Wandsworth Borough News than the group that came first, <laughs> because of our age, you know, it says, mm. you know, 15-year-olds 15 15 year walk away with third prize. In fact, um, later on, when... Uh, one of my daughters were at school and um, being a bit cheeky to one of the teachers that, and the teacher said, if you don't behave, I'll tell your dad. And uh, my daughter said, you don't know my dad. And that same teacher brought to school <laughs> that clipping because her brother was the drummer in the group <laughs> at the time. Okay. And that was how I managed to get a hold of that clipping. You know, Right. Mm. Incredible. So, So as a result of that, things started to happen for your musical career, yes. I imagine. And what was the advent of the engineering stuff? Well, what happened was, at school, they built a recording studio. Now, this was unheard of in the 60s. Um, I consider that I went to a really good school. Um, they built this recording studio, and the studio was meant to record um, sound effects and plays. It was, it was meant for the English department. But then um, I managed to steer it around so that music was recorded in there with, you know, bringing my band in there and, um, you know, turning it into a, a bit of a music studio as well. Mm. You remember the name of that band? The band at the time was called Stonehenge. Um, the band before that was called Roadworks Ahead. And just at the end of Stonehenge... Um, that was when I started to form the band Matumbi. Mm, okay. 
So you, you have a thing for bringing musical skill together to make rhythmic music. Yes. Um, the thing about it was that I learned that there were two other boys at school who could do vocal harmonies really well. And b between the three of us, you know, we could sing any Drifters song or, you know, um, any Beatles song or any Beats Boy song and hold our harmony parts. And people were amazed that um, the three of us could, you know, knew music that well that we could do three-part harmonies. And um, I remember a friend called Morris Hope saying, you should um, form a group and have a keyboard player in there. Because until then, most groups were guitar groups, you know, and because um, we didn't know anyone our age that had a keyboard. I mean, we knew people that could play the piano, but I mean, can you imagine trying to carry a piano around? And then this young lad um, by the name of Nick Straker came and um, he had a, um, a Vox Continental organ um, with, with the black keys were white and the white keys were black. Mm. So the keyboard was basically black and where the black notes are, they were white. And um, he could play it very well. So one day I invited him to have um, what was the equivalent of a, a piano duel in the uh, music room where um, there were two pianos and we started to play and then at one point I thought give up you're the greatest and to this day he's um, you know still a friend of mine and we we still play together mm. now in many quarters you're credited as being the man that created the genre lovers rock is that the truth I think I helped to create it certainly um, I wouldn't say that any one person created it. I mean, it was a group of people that created um, that sound. Um, quite often, I will admit that um, some songs that have become famous in that genre, I'm guilty of having played more than one instrument on them. Like, for instance, um, Louisa Mark, Caught You in a Lie. Um, that that was the the first um, lovers rock of our, you know, our, our age group, our generation that um, made people sit up and take note and think, hang on, there's kids in England making music that, you know, is quite good uh, and it's worthy at least of the sound systems to play it because um, Lloydie Coxon, who's the supremo of um, Sir Coxon Sound, um, had um, come to me and said, look, um, I have a sound system called Sufferer and people were saying, well, you've, you know, You've outplayed nearly everyone, but you haven't played Coxon, you know, and you don't become a champion sound until you play Coxon. So I was like vying for him, you know, the young bull was like, yeah, come on in, Coxon. Let me and you meet in a place. I'll show you what I can do. And he was like, don't even bother, because, look, I spent years building my name as Sir Coxon. Why am I going to gamble it with you in a dance for 100 quid in one night? You know, it's better if we don't meet. And we were neighbours and um, members of the same church and stuff, and he said to me, look, I tell you what, I want to make a recording of this song, Caught You in a Lie. I want to do a reggae version. Will you help me? So we we joined forces at that point because his sound system was the top sound system in Europe even. Mm -hmm. And uh, he used to have a phrase to say, we don't play English music. We only play Jamaican music, strictly from yard, pre-release, our dub wise, you know. And so by doing that in the studio with him, that record, and him playing on his sound system, he was in effect eating his own, wor eating his own words. Mm -hmm. uh, because there he was playing something that was made in England and something that I'd played the bass, the guitars, the, the keyboards, I'd even played the synthesizer on there. And uh, our drummer, Uton Jones from Matumbi, was the drummer, and Louisa sang. And uh, it, it, it was hugely successful, that song. So that was the, the kind of um, the template for that style of English lovers um, music by, you know, young British people. And um, quickly after that, we, I, we dropped another tune in the same sort of vein by Matumbi, which was called After Tonight, and another one called The Man in Me. Mm. And, um, and on all those recordings, I... I I'd been multi-instrumentalist, you know, and um, it followed on from there. I did um, another song called Black Skin Boy, 
uh, by 15, 16, 17, and um, walk away and uh, choose me, Marie Pierre, and then eventually, um, after meeting Janet Kay uh, on a session where I was just the sound engineer, and uh, the engineer didn't, uh, the 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 producer was not musical, he was fiscal, you know, <laughs> um, he just paid the bill for the studio, but I mean, as far as the music was concerned, that wasn't his department, and he'd had um, Sly Dunbar on, on the drums and Lloyd Parks playing bass, you know, because they were over um, working with Dennis Brown at the time, mm -hmm. and Janet was doing a version of That's What Friends Are For, Denise Williams. And died recorded with Janet on um, a tune called I Do Love You, where I played the bass and um, most of my band members had played on that one and for the same record label called D-Roy. Mm -hmm. And so after helping her with, you know, the harmonies and stuff on, the, on that session, she volunteered to help me with any one of my projects that I was, you know, going to do. And I had a song that I was, you know, intending on making, but looking for the right singer. And when I heard her voice, I thought, yeah, she's the right singer. And um, I remember singing um, these notes again. She went, yeah, I could do that. And I was like, okay, you're in. And we cut that tune and the rest is history. Mm, so that was Silly Games. Silly Games. Right. Now... Silly Games has become quite popular. I mean, I'm, I'm told it's still being played on mainstream radio. It actually Absolutely. crossed over. Yes. How were you able to promote those songs back then? Well, I didn't promote the song um, on the radio. I promoted the song on the sound systems. And uh, what I did was to give every sound system a copy of the song from Brighton, to Scotland I mean you know all any sound system because by then being a member of a sound system myself I knew most of the sound systems in Birmingham in Manchester in Liverpool in Leeds in you know Bristol all around the UK so and when they'd heard it you know everyone was anxious to play it because it was such a fresh new sound so um, it wasn't um, a question of trying to force it on them they were calling me up asking for copies of it you know so by the time I'd put it on what we call dub plate and um, the sound systems were playing it in the dances, people were getting familiar to the song and, and wanting it, you know, waiting for its release. So by the time it was released, um, it was very well received. Mm. So what do you think was responsible for its crossover appeal? Well, its crossover appeal now was due to the fact that um, Lightning Records had got a deal with Warner Brothers, a distribution deal with Warner Brothers. And um, they were about to open a new label to try and put reggae into the charts. And the first song they tried with was Silly Games. And it was, you know, hugely successful. I think they had Dennis Brown, um, Money in Your Pocket on that label as well, and um, Errol Dunkley, OK Fred. Um, songs that actually crossed over into the charts. These boys had um, pluggers, you know, and um, they were plugging Warner Brothers music, you know, and, and to have a, an, uh, an affiliate of Warner Brothers, you know, a reggae label um, made the difference that, that we got into the shops that were what we term chart return shops. So... Um, the figures would then be received at um, the B into the BBC chart machine, and um, you know the the DJs were playing it, so it was popular, you know, and it took off. Mm. Do you think, after all these years now of its success and and popularity, that if you had to do it again, that you do something differently with that song? Um, in terms of the recording, no. Perhaps um, in terms of its management, um, yes. Because what happened was that by the time the song was in the top of the charts, we hadn't we thought, thought about, about a follow-up. We hadn't bargained, bargained on the success, success so we hadn't planned a follow-up. 
So what happened then was that um, a song that Janet had recorded previously was then brought to the fore by uh, some other producers who had nothing to do with Silly Games and proclaimed to be the follow-up. So it confused the audience a bit about what was really the follow-up, you know, to Silly Games. And uh, I think two or three other songs came out at the same time and it, it, it did cause some confusion. Now, if we'd have had um, a better hand on the situation, you know, we'd have been able to stop the flood of um, music that came out of previously recorded songs that then confused the public to say which one is the follow-up, which, you know, which one should we buy. So instead of buying only one, there was like three or four, so which one is it, you know? Um, and also, we hadn't yet finished um, recording an album. So we didn't have enough material to go, well, here's the album now, or here's the follow-up. So there was a lapse of time. And in between that time, um, Janet had, um, you know, showed interest in, in acting. And um, she had um, gained a part in a TV sitcom. So I think she'd already been to the top of the charts. Now she wanted to be a successful actress. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Okay, we take a break there. Yeah. My camera first, yeah. So I go first, yeah, Kwame and then on it. Yeah, go. Okay, cool. Um, yes, Dennis. So you've had a quite interesting journey into the whole creation of Lovers Rock. Um there's been a rumor bandied about that you've worked with the likes of Marvin Gaye. Um, could you shed some light on that for us? Yes, um in the eighties when Marvin Gaye was um, around London, just after sexual healing, uh, a friend of ours, a mutual friend, uh, by the name of Julio Finn, and he um, was a friend of Marvin's and a friend of mine, he, he, he thought it would be interesting if I did some dub mixing to some of you know, Marvin's stuff. And uh, Marvin was recording in a studio called Air, George Martin's studio. And he wasn't happy with the the sound, what he was doing, you know. And he wanted to know if I could rough it up a bit and make the sound a bit heavier, you know. So, yeah, I rose to the, the challenge and went down and met him and uh, started work almost immediately mixing an album he was doing called Love Man. And uh, I remember the first track was a track called Ego Tripping. And uh, he was amazed at the sound that I got. He was like, yeah, this is like home. Yeah, you got the sound, you got the feel. You're the first person to get the sound that I'm looking for. Continue. But unfortunately, in, within about three weeks after that, um, Marvin had um, died. Because I remember um, finishing the work and, and going off on holiday to Barbados and hearing on the radio, that he died, and I'm thinking that oh, that's a hoax because I was just with him last week. Mm. But it was in actual fact true. Shame. Mm. So, so there is nothing as such that you can point to to say, well, this is what you guys worked on? No, because um, what happened, unfortunately for me, I'd taken um, a cassette of the work we were doing, and one night I just left my car open outside of my grandmother's house and someone just helped themselves to all my cassettes out of the car and um, I was, you know, deterred from going on the radio to say, look, the person who stole that stuff, bring it back because um, my cousin who worked um, for, you know, Radio Fusion in Barbados said, don't go on the radio because if you do, that person's probably only then going to realise what it was that they've stolen from you. And then you're going to end up with pirates of Marvin Gaye all over the country. So, you know, in fact, if you don't say anything, just suffer in silence. So yeah, yeah. I agreed to do that. Okay. Um, and then there is talk, too, about you having worked with Iroy. Yes. Yeah? Well, Iroy had come to London in the 70s as the top Jamaican new, brand new toaster. And um, he had... Um, 
a, an album called Socialism. And he came and Matumbi, my band Matumbi, provided the backing for his first tour. Because um, what we had done um, by then, we, we provided the backing for Pat Kelly, for um, Ken Booth, Johnny Clark, Derek Morgan, and now Iroy was the, the, the first toaster, right, to come to play live with a band. You know, because toasters usually were so, as associated with sound system. You put the sound system, put the, the B side of the record on, and off you go. But this time he was going to play with a live band. And we were the ones that were chosen to be his live band. And so we became, you know, very friendly. And in fact, instead of staying um, a six months or something, he, he ended up here for about two years. And during that time, you know, he, we became very close friends. And he came from Jamaica once with an album that he'd recorded in Jamaica. And I mixed it in the studio. And we went to um, Virgin Records to, to deliver the album, and they amazed me by not liking it, you know. And then they suggested to him that he should go in the studio with me to make some new cuts, mm. you know. And that album that we mixed, I also had that in the car with the, um, the cassettes oh, that um, got stolen <clears throat> in Barbados. And um, we went into the studio and we cut... Um, I cut four or five tracks of reggae and four or five tracks of funk with Iroid to make him the first Jamaican toaster rapper to be doing his stuff on soul music. You know, um, that album, he was a bit apprehensive about whether or not he, it was going to lose him the hardcore fans. Mm. So instead of putting the Iroid seal on it, he put, he put the album out as Roy Reed which was his, you know, proper name. Um, so not many people knew him as Roy Reed. Everyone was looking for I Roy. You hear the voice and go, yeah, that's I Roy. But you see the opposite, that's Roy Reed. You think, is this some kind of impersonator of I Roy, you know? <laughs> and, I was, and I was quite upset with him for that um, when I saw the album cover. But um, one tune from the selection, a tune called Wappen Bappen, I then put that tune into the soundtrack of the film Babylon, and and then put on there, put I Roy. <laughs> Had you seen that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine he didn't take very kindly. No, no, no. He, I, I Roy always saw me as the cheeky little kid, you know, that would wouldn't um, wouldn't take what he said as big brother mm -hmm. to say, yeah, you got to do this, and I go, yeah, why? <laughs> you know, why? So what about if I want to do this instead? You know, he's going, you're cheeky, you are, you know, because I didn't, I didn't think that, you know. Um, anyone had the right to say you can't do this or you mm -hmm. can't do that as far as music was concerned you know there were no boundaries you can do whatever you like you know it, it's whether or not other people like it yeah yeah so you guys were basically pioneers at the time doing yeah we try anything I mean I remember the day when I walked into the studio with a fuzz box and a wah wah pedal <laughs> we all go with that <laughs> you know what I mean it's like hey them thing there's rock things in the, some Jimi Hendrix business. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm I'm playing <laughs> in this reggae music going, man. Well you're mad. And now I I live to see, you know, Al Anderson come on the scene and with Bob Marley, right? And tear the show up with that stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Times have changed, man. Yeah. Does the phrase brain damage mean anything to you? Yes, um, Brain Damage was the title of my album in 1980. When I opened my recording studio in Southwark, um, word reached Japan that I was opening the recording studio, and I had a call from Ruichi Sakamoto, who is the, the chief of um, a group called Yellow Magic Orchestra. He was the man in the film with David Bowie, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, who played the Japanese officer in that film. Uh, he's a very, very talented musician, exceptionally talented musician. In fact, um, the god of, you know, in Japan, he's like, you know, you speak his name, right, and people bow down, you know. And, and I hadn't realised that because Don Letts had introduced us and he asked Don Letts if he knew me and uh, he wanted to work with me. 
because he wanted he was interested in me mixing his Japanese electronic music in dub. <laughs> right? So when he heard I was building a recording studio, he said he called me up and said, I'm calling from Japan, I want I want to I want to use your studio. I was like, Yeah, right. I thought someone was in, I thought it was a hoax. <laughs> he said, I've got some equipment over in Germany, I want to send it over. I'm going, Yeah, another hoax. A guy in Japan's got <laughs> Germany, got equipment in Germany, he's gonna send it over. <laughs> this must be one of my friends winding me up, right? <laughs> so I accepted the booking, right? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 come, yeah. When do you wanna come? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one day a truck pulled up outside and went, Then it's my fault, yeah, sign here, we've got some equipment over. Like, ah! <laughs> you know, um, and the studio wasn't quite finished yet. I had to rush out and I borrowed some Dolby's from George Martin's studio from Air. And um, so I could do the work. And he wanted to use my recording studio before I did. He wanted to be the first person to use my <laughs> newly built recording studio. So I thought, OK, let's do it. And I was recording the Brain Damage album. Because Brain Damage was going to be my first solo album, um, double album, uh, upon kind of exiting from Matumbi and, um, you know, spending more time in the recording studio. Matumbi was still touring and, and, and I'd, I'd become a bit bored of touring, you know, a different hotel every night, you know, no, hardly any decent food in the back of vans and stuff. And um, I decided to open a recording studio, you know, so I could spend more time in the studio doing more productions with more artists and stuff, you know. And um, he came over and we did a track that was called Riot in Lagos. And um, Tim Westwood played that track to death, you know, uh, and made it really popular. In fact, when I went to Japan for the first time, people were like, oh, you work with him? Oh, let me touch you. You must be good if you work with that guy. And it catapulted me to, you know, near stardom in Japan. So when I went there, I, people knew who I was. Mm. Yeah. So Brain Damage. Brain Damage, the lyrics of Brain Damage goes, Brain Damage, too much for them manage. Brain Damage, may I tell you this, I want you. I want savage. Then it goes, boop. When it drop in at the hall, 45 get a ball, a fall. Strictly double up on the rubber and the people, them a ball. <laughs> DJ can't take it off the deck, opposition a sweat. Mash up the disco tech. Brain damage. Now, brain damage is about the hit of the day. Whatever mm -hmm. hit that, whatever the record, you hear it, you don't even like it, but you find yourself singing it. It's brain damage. The radio have played it so often that you've received it somehow and it's locked into you. Then, in the middle of Brain Damage, instead of putting a solo, mm -hmm. I decided to do a piece of poetry. And that poetry went, <clears throat> Wow, for the, next four, for the next half an hour, you're in tune to the thriller. Stereophonic, high fidelic showcase, exotic taste. This is the captain speaking. I'd just like to let you know you're aboard flight long plumatic. <laughs> Destination in a space. <laughs> Now, Flight Long Plumatic was like Flight LP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's my new LP, right? Yeah. Destination Inner Space. Because the, the record arm plays from the outside to the inner space. Mm -hmm. right? So that's the destination, inner space, right? <laughs> and um, I'm told that um, Rod Temperton heard that. And it inspired him to write a song called The Thriller. And we know who sang that. Mm -hmm. You know, so for me saying, right about now, you're in tune to The Thriller. Stereophonic, high fidelic, showcase, exotic taste. This is the captain speaking. I'd just like to let you know you're on board flight long plumatic. Destination <laughs> in a space, right? And then it went, Heavy Harry did I carry the swing? Till him buck up on that one, him have to step out of the ring. 25 hertz, hertz bass line, a bubble, 2.5 bit frequency. <laughs> Strictly, um, treble rocking in a reggae frenzy, brain damage. You know, like we're out of my mind on reggae, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, brain damage. Incredible. Incredible. So I'm thinking, all right, yeah, you did this this huge um, piece of music for Japan. Mm. As a consequence of that, how far do you think your music went? Well, um, by the time they heard Silly Games in Japan, they latched onto it, and it was a number one there. And uh, it catapulted Janet Kay to huge stardom in Japan. Um, after that, she'd made about 
six or seven albums in Japan with Japanese artists, and she was there every year. I mean, she says the only time she ever had a record deal was she was signed to um, Sony in Japan. Wow. Wow. And are there other countries around the world that you think would appreciate that music or who may have taken a liking to it? Of course. I mean, recently I've just returned from um, Argentina. Now, Argentina is 13 hours and 40 minutes flight from here, direct, which is further away than Japan. And uh, there's a group there called Los Cafres. Now, they're the top reggae band in Argentina. And um, I, had, I happened to be there with um, Red Bull Music Academy as one of the lecturers and one of the seminar holders on, on music for um, the Red Bull Music Academy. And I met this, these youngsters that said that they uh, were familiar with my music. And, and to prove it, they invited me to a show that um, they were doing where they did a salute to me and played about 10 of my tunes back to back, you know, really well. And so the next day they were recording in the studio and they invited me to come down and have a listen. So I went down there with a friend of mine, you know, just hanging out in the back of the studio. And they were working on this track. And the track was called Bastara. And uh, which in Spanish means enough. And the, and the singer was saying, isn't it enough that I love you? It was a kind of lover's rock track. So at one point, one of them said, ah, it would be nice if we had a kind of DJ on this track. You know, a ragamuffin DJ. <laughs> and, you know, flippantly I said, yeah. I said, will you do it? I said, OK, explain the song to me, because they're singing in Spanish. Mm -hmm. They explained the song to me. Then I take my pen and I quickly write, just for you, just for you. Well, girl, there's nearly nothing that I man wouldn't do. Say, just for you, just for you. Well, let me just make a wish and make your dream come true. Come, <laughs> they come home early every night. I say that, you know. And uh, just mucking around. A year later, they called me and said, yo, we've been very successful with that tune and it's in the charts. Will you come back and do it live? We're gonna, we know we're, we're presenting our new album in Argentina. In Argentina. <laughs> so, of course, I was on the next plane, but not before grabbing my um, CD player because I, I really didn't know the lyrics that I'd because it was just like a one-off ad thing, yeah. ad lib thing, you know. Learning it, getting to um, this place called um, Luna Park in Buenos Aires, and um, a friend saying, oh, "These boys are really." cheeky to put a show on here there was a festival here the other day with three different bands and um so we remain nameless and it wasn't full <laughs> you know so i don't know who they think they are it's a ten thousand seater mm. man that night it was sold out and when i hit the stage with just for you just for you the, the ceiling nearly come off <laughs> right so i said to um one of the guys in the band i said Did anybody Anybody videoing this? Is, oh, I want a copy of this. People back home never going to believe this happened. Yeah. Going, it's going to be on YouTube tomorrow, they said. And sure as hell it was. On YouTube, you can go to see it now. You can see Dennis Bovell con Los Cofres um, Bastara in Luna Park. And it's, like, it's off the hook. Little Spanish kids are recite, singing along with me going, mm -hmm. just for you, just <laughs> for you. Right? And I'd started the, the tune by going, oh! Like Tarzan, Tarzan. That, yeah, <laughs> and then there was a, a, a competition to say, was that the real Tarzan or was it Dennis Bavel? And some people said that was Dennis Bavel. They won tickets to the show. That's incredible, you know. Man. And then um, I just recently returned to Argentina to work with another group called um, Dancing Mood. Now, Dancing Mood uh, were anxious to have some Lovers Rock on their new album, so um, I contacted Janet Kay, Carol Thompson, um, Sandra Cross. AJ Franklin, Winston Reedy, Winston Francis, um, Georgia Ellis, and myself. And we all sang a tune on their album. And, and they, they just released a three CD box set with um, about 60 tunes on. And, and we've all got a tune on the album. And uh, they actually re they, they recorded the music and sent the music here. Then we put the voice on and sent it back and they mixed it. Oh, and it sounded right. really good. I, mean, I was just there in February um, performing with them in a place called Connix and another place called 
Mar del Plata. So South America, they, you know, they're going real good for, for reggae. <clears throat> the name Dennis Bubbles seems to have resonated with quite a few people around the world. Now, going back a bit to your history, where you're essentially from Barbados. That's right. And then you, you're doing reggae music, and then you, you're into this genre, um, Lovers Rock. Mm -hmm. Did you have any resistance from Jamaican producers or promoters? God, can I ask that question again, please, sir? Yeah? Okay. It's got done. Is that finished? Yeah. Um, stop it. And and just... You sure nothing's on there? For, for you, I haven't used it. I didn't use it. No. no didn't use okay, cool. I'm good to go. Dennis, you being from Barbados, essentially, um, and you find yourself in reggae music and lovers rock, have you had any resistance from Jamaican producers, promoters, and so on to the fact that you're not Jamaican? Not at all. Um, in fact, um, producers like Bunny Lee uh, often offered to take me to Jamaica because he, he was... Um, fascinated with the fact that um, a young kid from Barbados was making all this noise in England with reggae music. I mean, Lloyd Chalmers, too. They, I was frequently being invited, you know, to Jamaica for artists, Leroy Smart, you know, um, I Roy wanted to take me to Jamaica, but I, I never did. And the, the first time I went to Jamaica was to work with a group called Chalice, um, who had just, you know, been very successful on the, the Sunsplash scene. And they were signed to a German company. And um, the company wanted me to produce them. And, and we'd met in London because they'd, they'd come over and done some shows with Linton and myself and expressed a wish for me to come to Jamaica to, to produce one of their albums. And so off I went. And then the next time I went was to work with um, Pablo Moses because um, Jeffrey Chung had um, passed away and they were in the middle of an album and they needed someone to... to to carry on the album and they you know thought that I was that person so I was honored to be called in and went there to you know work with um Pablo Moses Confessions of a Rastaman <laughs> plus I've got a really good Jamaican accent as well so I could fit in <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> do you think Lovers Rock had a part to play in the development of pop music at all absolutely I mean I remember when those kids that are in UB40 were young kids, and their their um, dad was um, promoting my group Matumbi, and I'd see them, you know, in the front row, you know, practically like catching what we were doing, and and then coming up with a group that was had the same amount of members as us, and 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 trying to, you know, come off with the same kind of vocal harmonies as us and and stuff. I mean, I remember hearing um, Boy George, who was working with a friend of mine called Weasel in uh, Ladbroke Grove, coming with that, do you really want to hurt me? You know, Culture Club, right? Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, um, I remember seeing posters with um, a show by Steel Pulse with the support band, a group called The Police, right? And then watching and hearing Sting s imitating David Hines. You know, that kind of... Uh, uh. Mm -hmm. at, that, at the end of your voice, voice, right? And actually, you know, being successful with it. I mean, and groups like um, Madness coming along and, and taking the Prince Buster tune, one step beyond, you know, mm. and doing that and, and becoming successful. Of course they were watching and of course they, learnt, they caught on. And um, <clears throat> people used to say in the beginning, you know, white guys can't play reggae. Nonsense. You know, anyone who wants to do anything, right, with blood in their veins can do whatever they want. If you want to speak Dutch, you can speak it. If you want to speak German, you can speak it. I mean, and all music is language anyway. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn to play classical, you get, I mean, you don't have to look like Beethoven. Quite true. Quite true. With modern music today, I mean, we hear all this, this um, garage music, we hear all kinds of different types that youngsters seem to be gravitating towards. Do you think that Lovers Rock could experience a resurgence among the youth today as well? If it's played on the radio, of course. What happens is anything that's played on radio, 
you know, people take note of it. I mean, because the radio wave is frequency mutilation. <laughs> That's what FM is, right? And, um, you know, if, if, if it's pounded into you, I mean, funny enough, you know, they say that if you go to sleep listening to classical music, then it settles your mind for the next day, mm -hmm. right? Um, because, I mean, music can be used for anything. I mean, you know, when, when soldiers and armies are going to war, they have their war chant, their music, mm -hmm. bam, 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 you know. So making love, we have a different style of music. I mean, if you ever took the music away from a horror movie, right, and, and made it, in, you could make it into a comedy. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's a stretch. I'm sure, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if the music wasn't, you know, da, 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 so dramatic, right, it would be laughable. It was, da, 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 da. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't think the person was being killed. You'd, you'd think it's a joke. Mm. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Who would you regard as the greatest lover's rock artist of all time? Wow. I'd have to say... That question would have to be divided in two. It would have to be either the greatest British lover's rock or the greatest Jamaican lover's rock. Uh, for me, I would have to say Janet Kay because she's been the most successful. Um, but then Carol Thompson's great too. And so were Brown Sugar. And so was Trevor Waters. And on the Jamaican side, Dennis Brown, you know, um, Gregory Isaacs, you know, um, what's his name? Um, Barry Biggs, you know, Al Campbell, mm. all these people. Uh, Matumbi, I mean, Paul Dawkins, Tradition, you know, um, all these people that contributed to the thing. I don't think there's... Um, room to say the greatest of all time because all time's not yet over. <laughs> <laughs> We're still in that We're time. We're still in that time, so, you know. All right, so what's Dennis doing now? What projects are well, you working Well, I'm uh, just about to finish uh, a studio album. I'm doing two studio albums at the moment. Um, one vocal and one dub album. And the dub album's like, Streets ahead of the, the, the group album. And I've got in the can already an acoustic album where I've revisited some of my songs, some songs that people don't know that I wrote those songs because um, they were sung by other artists, you know, and a lot of people don't read the writing credit on the record. They just, they hear silly games, they go, Janet Kay. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't look about who the author was, right? Uh, they don't care who the producer is, often even. Uh, so I'm, I've revisited some of my earlier songs that were sung um, by other people with just giving it the acoustic touch where I'm playing the acoustic guitar with um, a classical style in mind. So fusing a classical style of acoustic with reggae. So I'm playing the bass line and the rhythm at the same time, you know, boom, ting, beam, 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 ting, 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 boom, 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 ting, ting, boom, 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 you know, with the gap, so you get the whole feel. And then other times I'm, I'm hitting the guitar out and out like if the tune was a folk tune, mm. right? But but with you can definitely hear the reggae in you know in the, in the gaps that I'm taking with it. I mean. So a lot of people have said, yeah, put that, put that, put that. Um, it's in the can. And I'm um, also just about to set off on a tour with Linton Gwesi Johnson of Europe. I've got some festivals to do in Japan in a month's time. And I'm off to Naples in a week's time to um, start some, you know, summer work. Mm, incredible. It's been a, a very interesting interview with you, you, Dennis. Um, any parting words? Yes. All y'all go out there and buy my record. <laughs> <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Well, there you've heard it, ladies and gentlemen. Dennis Boville, renowned for his work with 
Lovers Rock. Thank you very much, Dennis. My pleasure.